All right, today we'll talk about congenital cardiac defects. And congenital means there's a condition that you're born with. Um, so in utero, while the fetus is developing, something goes wrong with how the, um, the chambers of the heart develop, or something goes wrong with how the valves develop, and that's how they end up with this congenital cardiac defect. Um, we're going to have some categories to put all the heart defects into. And one of the categories is deciding whether it's an acyanotic defect or a cyanotic defect. If the defect causes um, the blood to still become oxygenated by the lungs, then, okay, yes, we have a defect, but we still have good oxygenation. So then we would put it under the category of an acyanotic defect, meaning no cyanosis. Um, however, if the defect causes blood to be shunted past the lungs and not pick up oxygen, and the oxygen saturation is going to be lower than normal, then we would call that defect a cyanotic heart defect. So with a cyanotic heart defect, there's shunting of blood from the left back to the right. It tells you that blood leaves the aorta, and goes back into pulmonary circulation via the ductus arteriosus. Um, so in your mind, imagine that connection between the aorta and the pulmonary artery and having a vessel connecting the two, the, the ductus arteriosus. And when you have that vessel connecting the two, if you have high pressure in the aorta and low pressure in the pulmonary circulation, um, which way would blood want to flow? From to yeah, higher pressure to lower pressure. So from the aorta back into pulmonary circulation. This is going to result in increased pulmonary blood flow. So you've got more blood going through the pulmonary vessels than normal. When you have an increase in pulmonary blood flow, you're still going to oxygenate the blood. You're going to like double oxygenate it, actually. Um, so it does not interfere with oxygenation. And then it gives you some examples, but the examples won't make sense until later on after you finish the packet or after we finish the packet together. And then you go back to study, and then you'll understand um, why these are listed here. So I'll skip them for now. All right, so a cyanotic defect means that the blood goes from the right side of the heart, doesn't travel to the lungs, and goes into the aorta without picking up any oxygen. So from the right heart to the aorta. The blood did not get oxygenated. Um, there's decreased pulmonary blood flow, and the infant will not oxygenate. Obviously, they'll oxygenate a little bit, because if they're not oxygenating at all, they'll be dead in four minutes. So just an exaggeration to show you that blood is not flowing to the lungs like it normally does. And the example of tetralogy of flow, we'll talk about later. All right, let's review fetal circulation. Um, so in utero, when the fetus is developing, the blood flow is different than adult circulation. Uh, blood flows down the aorta and goes into the femoral artery and the, what is it, the iliac artery, and that goes into the umbilical artery. Um, blood will then travel to the placenta to get rid of carbon dioxide, pick up oxygen, picks up nutrients, and then the blood will flow back to the heart, to the right side of the heart. Um, there's um, a shunt past the liver. The um, ductus venosus will shunt blood past the liver because the mom's liver has already detoxed the body and filtered the blood. Detoxed the blood and filtered the blood. Um, and then the blood continues back to the right atrium. We also have blood returning from the superior vena cava going to the right ventricle. And um, blood that gets into the right ventricle gets pushed into the pulmonary artery. And it's purple. Um, so blood gets pushed into the pulmonary artery. And some of it will travel to the lungs, very little of it, about 10% of it travels to the lungs. The rest of it will shunt past the lungs and go through the ductus arteriosus into the aorta. So that's one pathway. 
Um, the second pathway is blood coming into the right atrium can also go through the opening between the right atrium and the left atrium. That's the foramen ovale. And get into the left side of the heart that way. Um, so blood that gets into the left atrium goes into the left ventricle. And when the heart contracts, it pushes the blood into the aorta. So there's two pathways for blood to get to the aorta. And then once the baby's born, we expect the uh, foramen ovale to close from the high, higher pressure on the left side of the heart. Um, we expect the pulmonary vessels to dilate and all of the blood flows to the lungs, whereas in utero only 10% went to the lungs. So we get big pulmonary vasodilation. And now that the blood is flowing to the lungs, the ductus arteriosus becomes the pathway of least resistance. There's really no reason for blood to go into the aorta, so it just flows to the lungs. And then this should close um, within a few days or several weeks after birth. All right, so that's fetal circulation and then the transition. Um, there are some cardiac anomalies where you need a patent ductus arteriosus in order to get any blood to flow to the lungs because um, something happens to the pulmonary artery. It, it's occluded, it didn't develop correctly, and now the only way you can get blood to go to the lungs is if it crosses over from the aorta into the pulmonary artery through the ductus arteriosus. So sometimes you need that to stay open. Um, so again, it lists, you, lists some reasons why you want to keep the ductus arteriosus open, and you can review that when you go back through your notes. Um, sometimes we need to keep the pulmonary vascular resistance really high and reduce the amount of blood that's flowing to the lungs. Um, so how can we keep pulmonary vascular resistance high? Um, well, keeping the baby hypoxic will cause the pulmonary vessels to constrict. Remember hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction? If your oxygen level is low, it constricts pulmonary vessels. Acidosis constricts pulmonary vessels. Um, so how can we keep a neonate's um, blood hypoxic? 21% um, of course, and then can we go any lower than 21%? And the answer is yes, if we bleed in some nitrogen and even dilute that 21% FiO2 down to a lower percentage. And they do that? Yes. Well. So we're keeping the infant hypoxic on purpose. And why would we want to do that? To constrict the pulmonary vessels? Yeah, to constrict the pulmonary vessels. Um, there's too much flow going to the pulmonary vessels, so we want less to go to the pulmonary vessels. All right, so we'll start with the list of cardiac defects. The first one listed is PDA, or patent ductus arteriosus. This is the most common cardiac defect. And the more premature the infant, the higher the percentage. So less than 1750, um, so what is that, 1.7 kilograms. There's a 45% incidence of the ductus arteriosus staying open. And the smaller they are, like 1.2 kilograms, 80% of the time the ductus arteriosus doesn't close. Um, it tells you the ductus arteriosus is a blood vessel that connects the aorta and the pulmonary artery. Normally, this connection closes itself shortly after birth. If the ductus arteriosus remains open, blood is shunted from the left to the right, meaning from the aorta to the pulmonary artery. Um, do you understand left to right? Why is blood in the aorta considered left? Because it's coming from the left side of the heart? Yes. So the blood in the aorta came from the left side of the heart. And then to right, it's going back to the pulmonary circulation, which is from the right side of the heart. The higher pressure in the aorta pushes the blood into the ductus and into the pulmonary artery. And the result is getting an increase in the pulmonary blood flow. Um, so when you have more than the normal amount of blood flowing through your pulmonary vessels, 
Um, the vessels will start responding. Um, you get remodeling of the blood vessels. They thicken. Um, smooth muscle thickens. And over time, you get permanent pulmonary hypertension. Um, so it's something that we want to avoid. So that's when you would give the nitrogen to them to do, to that um, constrict their vessel a little bit? Um, to, yes, yeah, so if you have the increased pulmonary blood flow, how can you constrict it so there's less? Yes. I've never heard of nitrogen being given for PDA though, so, mm -hmm. but there are other ones. Um, so the treatment for a PDA is endomethacin. Endomethacin has a short onset of action and should cause the ductus arteriosus to spasm and then to close on its own. Another um, treatment is using Advil or ibuprofen. And that also will cause constriction of the pulmonary, um, the ductus arteriosus. In full-term infants with pulmonary hypertension, blood may flow from the pulmonary artery into the aorta via the PDA. So when you have really bad pulmonary hypertension, that's going to reverse the blood flow through the ductus arteriosus. So imagine if your pressure in the aorta is um, 50 millimeters of mercury systolic. But now you've got pulmonary hypertension and the pulmonary artery systolic pressure is 60 millimeters of mercury. So higher pressure in the pulmonary vessels than in the aorta. What's going to happen to blood flow? Shunt from right to left. Yes, it'll leave the pulmonary artery, go through the ductus into the aorta because the pressure is lower than it is in those um, constricted pulmonary vessels. All right, so when you're having that blood flowing through the ductus, it tends to keep the ductus open. And you can also get a right to left shunt when that happens. So pulmonary hypertension, really um, constricted pulmonary vessels, now the direction of the flow changes from pulmonary artery into the aorta. So if you go from the pulmonary artery straight into the aorta, do you ever travel to the lungs to pick up oxygen? No. no. So that's why right to left shunt causes hypoxemia or um, hypoxia. Is this life-threatening? Yes. Um, so with the um, pulmonary vessels constricted, sometimes they'll relax and then they'll constrict and then they'll relax and then they'll constrict. And when the pulmonary vessels relax and then blood flows to the lungs, You'll notice the neonate's O2 saturations improve, and then a little while later, the pulmonary vessels will constrict, the blood will start going through the ductus and not go into the lungs, and then you'll see the O2 sats fall. Um, so it can happen where they fluctuate. All right, so with, with normal pulmonary artery pressures, just a pure PDA, you expect the pressures from the aorta to push the blood into the pulmonary artery. So in your mind, I want you to think PDA, okay, blood is flowing from the aorta back into pulmonary circulation. Because that's typically what happens. High pressure in the aorta will push the blood um, into the lower pressure pulmonary system. <coughs> And then if pulmonary hypertension is mentioned, um, PPHN is mentioned, which way would it flow in that instance? Left to right or pulmonary artery to aorta? Uh, right to left. Right to left, so pulmonary artery into the aorta if there's pulmonary hypertension. All right, so that's it for PDA. The next one on the list is atrial septal defect. 
an atrial septal defect is a hole between the atria where um, the foramen ovale didn't close properly. Maybe the flap was too small and it left an opening or there's just incomplete closure. This happens in 10% of all congenital heart defects. Um, the higher pressure in the left atrium will force blood to flow into the right atrium. So the blood went to the lungs, picked up the oxygen, comes back to the left heart, and then, oh look, there's a hole. Let me go back over to the right atrium. <laughs> so um, is that going to cause cyanosis if that happens? No. no. So it gives you a blank to fill in. What are you going to put? A cyanotic. And then the picture, we've got blood flowing from the higher pressure in the left atrium, comes through that opening, the atrial septal defect, and back into the right atrium. So it kind of recirculates the blood. All right, and then ventricular septal defect is a hole between the two ventricles. And this is 20% of all congenital heart defects have a ventricular septal defect. And again, if you have a hole between the ventricles and you have higher pressure in the left ventricle, um, when the heart contracts, the blood is going to flow through that opening and go from the left ventricle back into the right ventricle. The diagnosis can be done with echocardiography, so an ultrasound. Um, with heart sounds, they're going to sound abnormal when listening, so it, it can be diagnosed just by hearing the heart sounds. Or with a cardiac cath and putting dye and watching the dye, um, you'll see the blood flowing back into the right ventricle. All right, so if it's flowing from the left ventricle to the right ventricle, is this a cyanotic defect or a cyanotic defect? A cyanotic. Everybody agrees, acyanotic? And it was already oxygenated and now it's recycling itself and going back into the right side of the heart. The lungs can be damaged from the extra flow extra blood flowing back to them. But with a VSD, um, the child can be asymptomatic, and depending on how large that opening is, they may wait just for the heart to grow, and it'll, it'll um, close itself, just with normal heart development. Um, so it doesn't always require a surgery. <coughs> what would be a symptom of this, then? Because it, it's asymptomatic, usually. Um, if they're asymptomatic, then nothing needs to be done. So how would they catch it? Probably listening to heart sounds. Oh, okay. okay here's the hole in the ventricle. Blood flows from the left ventricle, and the high pressure pushes blood through that opening and back into the right ventricle. And now you've got an increased amount of blood flowing to the lungs in the pulmonary circulation. All right, the next one is coarctation of the aorta. And this is narrowing of the aorta. Um, the narrowing decreases the blood flow to the body and makes the heart pump harder against the smaller than normal opening. So you have an increase in systemic vascular resistance. Let's look at the picture. So when you have a narrowing of the aorta, when the left ventricle um, contracts and pushes blood into the aorta, it meets up against a really high resistance. So it's really hard for blood to flow past this. 
So the left heart becomes enlarged very quickly from trying to do that extra work against the narrowed aorta. So coarctation means narrowing. All right, because of the high pressures, blood will back up into the pulmonary circulation. It'll back up all the way to the right heart. Um, it will also cause blood to flow through the ductus arteriosus back into pulmonary circulation. So um, having the ductus arteriosus open is helpful. Can you see how a connection between the two can help with, um, I guess it depends on where the narrowing is. In this picture, it's showing the ductus arteriosus after the narrowing. That would work out really well. Do you know why? Because it's being put back into the pulmonary artery. So it can mm. get oxygen. Well, no, it's already oxygenated. So if the opening was before, if the ductus arteriosus is before the coarctation, now you've got um, like a relief of pressure and blood will flow back into pulmonary circulation. So there's two possibilities here. Let me describe the possibility that they're showing you. All right, so you've got the narrowing of the aorta and you don't have much blood flow after that narrowing but you've got the ductus arteriosus. So with everything backed up, can you imagine high pressures in the pulmonary circulation? Mm -hmm. And with the high pressures, blood will pass through the ductus arteriosus and get to the aorta? Mm -hmm. So in this case, wouldn't it help out to mm -hmm. have the ductus open? It's kind of like a, a pressure pop-off, I guess. <laughs> and it'll push blood into the aorta. And that's one way where the lower part of the body can actually get blood flow. Um, so you've got the narrowing, and then after the narrowing, you've got the ductus arteriosus providing some blood flow to the rest of the body. So that's one possibility. The possibility if it happens before the narrowing in the coarc. Wouldn't that add to the pressure? If it's a, a right to left shot? Yeah, so let's think through this. Before the coarctation, there's real yeah, high pressure in the aorta. Where is that? Is that going to push blood? Into the, yeah, it's into the left pulmonary to the right. vessels? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think the pulmonary vessels kind of lose out on this one, don't they? There's going to be a backup of blood no matter what. There's going to be a lot of flow of blood. But without, um, so let's see, test question. Uh, a baby has coarctation of the aorta. Is it recommended to close the ductus arteriosus, put a band around the ductus and close it off? No. So no. that no blood is going back into the pulmonary vessels? No. No, that's not a good idea. <laughs> because you need some place for the blood to go. So you would not want to close off the ductus. And that's to relieve pressure? That's like what they want? Is yeah, to for the pressure? Um, having the ductus before the coarctation mm -hmm. would relieve the amount of pressure in the aorta. Okay. But then at, at the expense of the <laughs> pulmonary artery? Perfect, yes. Okay. Yeah, now we're engorging the pulmonary arteries with a whole bunch of more um, of blood flow. Right. So that's definitely not good. So it's like permissive to some extent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so do you want to add any of that to your notes? So there's two possibilities. Um, coarctation before the ductus arteriosus would be number one. Coarctation before the ductus arteriosus Blood will flow from pulmonary artery into the aorta. And 
and this will provide blood flow to the lower part of the body. You got that? So this will mm -hmm. provide blood flow to the lower part of the body. <coughs> All right, number two, um, coarctation after the, the uh, ductus arteriosus or after the DA. Um, how do you want to put that into your words? Like increased flow of blood back into pulmonary circulation? So you have um, really high pressure in the aorta that's going to push blood through the ductus arteriosus and back into pulmonary circulation. So in that case, it would be real large, left to right, shunt. And then if the um, ductus arteriosus is after the narrowing or after the coarctation, now you've got blood going from the pulmonary artery into the aorta and bypassing the lungs. Would you, oh, I'm sorry, are you finished writing that? What would you expect for blood pressure in the lower ex extremity? So if you palpate pulses in the femoral arteries and compare that to pulses in the carotid artery, would you expect them to be equal? Would one be greater than the other? I think uh, this one would be greater. Lower would, lower would be lower. I like that. <laughs> Very good. So you're not getting blood past that narrowing. Again, I'm exaggerating. Very little blood gets past that coarctation, so you have a lower blood pressure in the lower extremities. Do we cover everything? So the ductus arteriosus helps. All right, next one is aortic valve stenosis. There's a narrowing between, well, the valve is narrow, it just didn't develop correctly. So now blood is having a hard time leaving the left ventricle because of the narrowed aortic valve. Um, that's going to cause reduced blood flow to systemic circulation. That would be both the head and the feet. If you've got a problem with the valve and uh, um, blood has a real hard time leaving the left ventricle because that valve is narrowed. It leads to left heart failure. Oh, can you imagine? You pump and the blood doesn't go anywhere. Um, so it may help to have a PDA. Can you imagine how? So it's, it's not going from where to where? The aortic valve? Yeah, so the valve uh -huh. is narrow. So it's backing up and then since it's backing up, the pressures in the pulmonary artery will be higher since it's not getting through to the aorta, mm -hmm. and it's passing through the patent ductus arteriosus to the aorta. Okay, so um, blood in the left ventricle isn't getting out, so the flow backs up into the atrium, it backs up into the pulmonary vessels, and now you're gonna have high pulmonary artery pressures. Just like we talk about with adults with left heart failure, and if the heart is not pumping correctly, blood backs up into the pulmonary circulation, and that's how we end up with um, cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, so same thing. If you have a, a bad aortic valve, same thing happens. Mm -hmm. And then with blood shot from your pulmonary artery into the aorta? Yes. So then you'd be given some blood Yes. Very good. So if you imagine um, the ductus arteriosus in this picture, then you have real high pressures in the pulmonary circulation because everything backed up into the pulmonary vessels. Now the pathway of least resistance is going to be from pulmonary artery into the aorta. So 
So is that going to be cyanotic or acyanotic? Cyanotic. Cyanotic, very good. Because blood is going to go from that high, um, all that blood flow in the pulmonary circulation will cause high pressure. Um, so high pressure pulmonary circulation will push the blood through the ductus arteriosus into the lower pressure in the aorta. Um, with Tetralogy of Fallot, um, the name comes from four heart problems. Um, I like to call it two heart problems, and the other two are a result of the heart problems, but I didn't name it, so <laughs> let me explain it to you. Um, one thing that happens is there's a large hole between the two ventricles, so there's a ventricular septal defect. Um, there's a hypoplastic pulmonary artery. So blood flowing um, from the right ventricle into the pulmonary artery, it's so narrowed and underdeveloped that blood has a hard time flowing to the lungs. So can you imagine the right ventricle pumps, it pushes the blood into the pulmonary artery, but if the pulmonary artery is really, really tiny, you're not going to get much blood flowing to the lungs. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So there, because of this um, narrowed pulmonary artery, when the right ventricle pumps to push the blood into the pulmonary artery, there's so much resistance, um, the muscle ends up developing. Just like we lift weights to develop our muscles, um, the right ventricle does the same thing. It's pumping against this resistance, and because there's so much resistance, the muscle starts building up. So you get um, enlargement of the bottom right side of the heart. This is some wording that is meant for lay people that haven't had medical training. <laughs> so it, it should say enlargement of the right ventricle. And this is caused by the increased resistance against which the right heart must pump. And then the aorta is taking blood from both ventricles. So when blood, when the heart contracts, blood from the right ventricle goes into the aorta, and blood from the left ventricle goes into the aorta. So it, it, both types of blood are mixing and then going into the aorta. So does this sound like a cyanotic heart defect or a cyanotic? Cyanotic. Cyanotic. Yeah. 